Hi everybody and welcome back to The Local Show. If um, if it's your first time or if you haven't already, I would encourage you to um, please click the subscribe button. Um, and if the content today is something that you think may be of interest to any friends or family, I would encourage you to share it with them. So today we're going to have a look at how the US government acted um, in the period of 1929 to 1940 specifically looking at the, their gold reserves and how they acted in relation to the gold and precious metal markets at that time bearing in mind that the 1929 crash led to the great depression um, and arguably in my opinion the actions of um, hoover and more specifically franklin delano roosevelt in my opinion not only extended but severely deepened the great depression um, so what we're going to do today is is read a little passage from uh, a book by Wayne Jett called The Fruits of Graft, Depressions Then and Now. Just quickly to read the blurb um, on, on Amazon here. What and who caused the Great Depression and is this recurring in America today? This book outlines these questions. The, fact, the facts will shock you and alter your worldview. Americans and people all over the world, are misled about the Great Depression, US financial markets and economic policy. This is reality even with constitutional protection for freedoms of speech and press, which we're now losing. The true story is finally told and documented by the fruits of graft. So yeah, I'm gonna read a small passage from chapter six, Almost the Worst of Times, 1929 to 1940 subsection amidst poverty government enrichment but just before we get on to that we will just do a quick catch up on q a so there were a few questions posted underneath uh, our last video up upload which was looking at strengths sticking to your strategy your investment strategy and the big picture so a few comments Carl Weber commented saying, great content, looking forward to more uploads, it deserves more, way more views. I'd recommend using followsm.com, it's the best way to grow your channel quickly. Thanks for your comment, Carl. Um, I'll definitely bear that in mind. I um, we, we currently have 186 subscribers, so not great, but it's only a new channel. I think most of those subscribers are hangover from having a, a boxing channel prior to this so everyone who subscribed subscribed and everyone who um will subscribe thanks very much i appreciate it and always let me know your feedback and um, if there's any constructive criticism or any abuse about my hair it's it's corona time at the moment so i, I can't get to a barber shop just yet but um but yeah thanks for that carl uh growing the the, the channel isn't something that's an immediate concern of mine i more want to get more comfortable with delivery of doing the videos and um, try and start making sure that I'm consistent with the frequency of the upload and start getting better with editing tools and things like that so um, as I start to improve the quality I'll then start to worry a bit more about ramping up the, the viewers but yeah thanks for that Carl. Um, DH, Darren, hi Luke really enjoying your videos thank you interesting and informative you mentioned the crash in the next two years approximately um do you not subscribe to the idea of the 18-year property cycle i was anticipating this to play out where we'll see property prices go sky high until 2024 and crash in 2025 um also btc bitcoin peaking at the end of 2021 are the latest predictions that i see do you think gold silver will do the same as bitcoin as in boom in 2021 but not enter a bear market as Bitcoin is predicted to enter in 2022. Um, okay, a few different things here, Darren. The 18 year property cycle, that's not something that I'm familiar with. I fundamentally don't like the idea of having, you know, specific time frames that you will be banking on the same things happening time and time again. I think that in any market, if, if you just try to loop purely based on a set amount of time for for things to revert full circle again 
I don't think that that would consistently play out too well. So, look, <laughs> in short, in terms of housing, I think that it will coincide, it will move effectively with the stock market, which I see going, like, and the main, the main market that I'm using as my kind of uh, guide that all markets are effectively f following um, throughout Europe and America is, is the Dow Jones. And at the moment, it's sitting at around uh, 23,000. I think it'll go as high as 40,000 before the collapse um, in likely in one to two years from now. Um, certainly somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000, I think, will be the top. So I am very much bullish. On the Dow Jones and on stocks in general and I think that housing will continue to have a period of similar of comparable growth while while stocks go up as well so I think we're just now beginning that euphoria stage a lot of people are calling for a dead cat bounce I don't believe that we will have have that um, pretty much all economics or all economists channels across YouTube are calling for people to move to gold and silver and precious metal markets now and that basically that the end is is nigh and I disagree fundamentally with every one of them I think that um, the monetary policy actions that have been taken all across the world over over the last couple of weeks and last couple of months really I think that they will have an effect that funny money will move its way into real estate markets and into stock markets propping them both up and I think that there's and this is sort of disappointing I'm sure for for people to hear because it's 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 not the sort of opinion that you typically hear but I think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency markets will reflect gold and silver markets in crashing over this next 12 to 18 months and um, I then believe that both will act as uh, as yeah, stores of value you know I think that we'll get to this stage where hyperinflation starts to, to take effect over the next year or two I see the dollar actually growing in strength I see the pound growing in strength uh, which is kind of a counterintuitive thing as there's so much printing going on at the moment but I do short term think that short to medium term think that the pound and the dollar will go from strength to strength as a result of which I think that stock markets and housing markets will increase in value and also as a result of which I think that um, gold and silver are going to fall as the dollar increases in strength and Bitcoin will likely fall as well. Um, short short term there may be a little more juice in, in the cryptocurrency run that we're seeing at the moment. I think that some small caps might even pop temporarily, but I think that that'll always be a distraction to lure people in before things start moving substantially lower. Look, across the board at the moment, the only place that people, like the average person is not heading to is the stock market. And people are very uncertain for the first time in years about their investments in housing. And it is that uncertainty, that contrarian view of the 1% who win while the rest lose that you need to be paying attention to that because so many people, if you look at Twitter, everybody um, talking about these sorts of markets is talking about, oh, this is the time for Bitcoin. This is the time for gold. And when everybody's joining the party together, the herd lose, the sheep lose. It's the individuals who are sailing out alone that typically win. So um, I know I'm not specifically answering your question in terms of the 18 year property cycle. I'm sorry, I'm just not aware of it. But I think you've got a, a rough idea of where you think, <clears throat> where I think things are going to head. Um, again, I would just say that if you are looking to get in to gold or silver or, or Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, while I do think that its bottom will be a year to two years from now, I would always err on the side of get in early and don't be afraid to get er get in early and hold because if you try and time the bottom quite often, you'll miss it um, and you can potentially be in a worse situation then as a result. So yeah, Darren, thanks for your comment. And then 
James Renahan and, and John Smith both are kind of asking similar questions. Uh, James Renahan saying that he's 22 year old, just out of college, no debt. He has a UK company pension, um, but he has approximately 10,000 euro with a uh, credit, un credit union account. Okay. Cash could be king again shortly, but I'd like an alternative. What do you suggest I do for the next while? And then John Smith is asking, I'm 50-50 exposed to cash and the yellow metal. Um, should I YOLO into stocks right now? Your bias is that you have, you don't trust stocks haven't missed out in the big bull market. Yeah, totally understandable. Um, that's the same with, with the vast majority of people. And the problem is in this sort of scenario, John, most people will get in when it's too late. But people typically get in during euphoria. They don't get in at times like now. So to answer both of your questions quickly, I would I would get involved in the stock market now. I would look at a stock which is, you know, I would do your own due diligence in terms of what company to invest in, but I would go for one that has taking, taken a beating as a result of the crash in the last few months um, one that you think is probably undervalued at the moment and I would get in and I would hold for the next for the next year to year and a half I'll, and I have to say initially that I'm not a financial advisor I am a financial engineer but I'm not a qualified financial advisor so this is not investment advice but I personally like the look of for my own investment sake a company called Beaks Financial Cloud you might beat me to an entry in it because I'm not actually I'm not exposed to it just yet, but I'm looking to start laddering in over this next week or two. So if you beat me to it, good on you. But I think that it'll go up by over 100% anyway, comfortably over the next 12 to 18 months. So Beaks Financial Cloud, I would advise looking at that. But um, yeah, getting involved in the stock market right now is probably not a bad idea. But you must be willing to pull the plug when you see things to start getting start getting euphoric. Okay, that'll wrap up the Q&A for today. And we're going to move on to the Fruits of Graft. Okay. I will link, by the way, the this book in the description below where you can get it. I initially heard Wayne Jett, the author of the book, speaking about its contents uh, on a podcast online. I'd previously never heard of him. And I was so fascinated by the content, by what he was talking about, that I thought, right, I have to get this book. I um, went onto Amazon and saw that you could only get the book hardcover for £100, and that was before factoring in shipping from America. So that was quite disheartening, but then I noticed that you could also get um, a Kindle version for like £7.30. I didn't have a Kindle at the time, so I since uh, got this Kindle at Christmas, and... I'm about 30% into the book at the moment. So, yeah, it's a mind-blowing book, frankly. Some of the contents here, it's incredible. Um, some of the things that were happening in the early 20th century and even before then, uh, right up to towards the end of World War II I am now. But yeah, so I'll just start reading rather than rambling. Amidst poverty, government enrichment. This is a subsection of chapter six. The World Gold Council preserves data collected from central banks and governments, including the US Treasury of gold reserves held during the years 1845 to the present day. What the data reveal is jaw dropping and would shock most Americans who continue to re revere FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt. During the first 30 years of the 20th century, so 1900 to 1930. US gold reserves grew strongly and steadily, increasing from 600 metric tons in 1900 to 6,358 metric tons in 1930, a more than tenfold rise within 30 years. So in the first 30 years of the 20th century, US gold reserves increased by 10 times. Under the rules of the gold standard, monetization of these reserves would provide Americans greater buying power, a 
positive for all producing nation, nations. What is extraordinary, even shocking, is the path followed by US gold reserves between 1930 and 1940. While Americans struggled through the worst economic depression in US history between 1931 and 1935, gold reserves in federal treasury vaults jumped 41.5% to 9,000 metric tons. This was the status uh, at year-end 1935 as millions of Americans faced utter starvation. But this was not the end of it. Between 1936 and 1940, Roosevelt's government made a great leap forward in acquiring gold for Treasury's vaults, a leap of staggering proportion. US gold reserves jumped from 9,000 metric tons in 1935 to 19,500 metric tons in 1940. During these five years of abject poverty for millions of Americans, Roosevelt added more gold to federal reserves, 10,500 more metric tons than the US Treasury had, had acquired previously in all of US history. The incremental addition alone is significantly more gold than the US Treasury has held at any time since 1970. A truly compassionate president might even have sold gold from the government's unprecedented reserves into foreign currency, so taxes could be cut even more and prosperity restored. No benevolent purpose can be ascribed to Roosevelt's actions. Ordinary Americans were impoverished and asset prices were kept low, enabling financial mercantilists, big business, and monopolists with giant capital pools to acquire assets cheaply. This occurred entirely within Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt's presidency and could have only produced further significant contraction of a national economy already collapsing under forces of high taxes and prohibitive, prohibitive tariffs that shut down international trade. Roosevelt determined that tax money was better spent on gold to be stored in treasury vaults rather than to be left in the hands of American taxpayers trying to earn a living, raising a family or building a business. What motivated a political leader to such an end? On what moral and ethical grounds does a government impoverish its own people to enrich itself? Even the divine right of kings embraced enrichment of the sovereign as the moral path towards betterment of the ruled subjects. This was the political worldview that prevailed throughout the Dark Ages while mercantilism dominated economic relations among nations. Franklin Roosevelt more than trebled the gold reserves of the US Treasury within eight years, producing the most impoverished decade in American history. He did this while imposing strict limitations against monetization of government gold, so as to prevent the people from prospering. This reprehensible conduct has, been, has not been reported to the American people, much less justified by federal officials, historians or economists. Almost finished. Economists have, qu have quailed at the task of identifying causes pointing fingers and laying blame for the Great Depression. Economic causes of Great Depression are there to identify and to rectify, but doing so requires determination to confront mercantilism. So that's a pretty mind-blowing chapter or mini chapter in that book. Effectively, the US had more gold than any country in the world in 1929 because they had tenfold increased their gold reserves in the first 30 years of the 20th century. Then we have the biggest crash at that time that they'd had in a, in a few generations in 1929. As a result, what did FDR do? Did he use that gold that they had in the reserves and go and sell the gold um, to other nations in order to get more dollars and stimulate the economy and to help the American people? No, he, he decided to double down and triple down on their gold buying. Once they had all the gold, don't forget that, as I mentioned last week, he also uh, signed a piece of legislation in, in 1933, which meant that you were legally obliged, if you were a US citizen, to give in any gold that you had to the US Treasury at um, $20.67 an ounce. Only to then, six, six months later, 
FDR to make another piece of legislation whereby he revalued gold from $20.67 to $35 an ounce. Following that, so initially, first 30 years of, this, of the century, they've bought 10 times more gold than ever before. Then we've got the biggest crash that there's been in generations. What do they do? Do did they use that gold? No, they go and take all the gold that they have off all the American people. Is that enough? Is that enough? Have we got enough gold yet? While all the people are literally starving to death across the country? Um, no, that's not enough. We're going to spend the next five years then buying gold from countries all over the world while they're sorting out their people. And that's why the Great Depression only existed in America. And it, things were bad in other countries, but not nearly as bad. And then what actually, people never really talk about what ended the Great Depression, how did it end? It didn't end. It went from, it went from 1929 to 1939 and then we had World War II. The only reason that employment then went up was because people were literally being employed to go to war. And if you think about it today, and this is kind of important because we're heading for a, a Great Depression and like a cataclysmic collapse. And this is one of the reasons why you know I've created this channel because I want people to start waking up um, if you ask people, if you ask the average person on the street right now to go to war, they would laugh at you. They would say, absolutely no, things are okay at home and I, I don't, I'm not going to go and kill some man at the other side of the world, some stranger, just another normal fella. And it would have been the same in 1929. If you had gone and tried to get people to go to war then, they would have just been like, no. But see, if you drag them through a depression for 10 years where fathers literally have no work they feel emasculated. They cannot get jobs. If they do, they are incredibly low paying. They don't feel like men. And they have to try and bring up a family for a decade plus. Then after that, the whole time the propaganda that's being fed to you is, oh, it's this enemy at the other side of the world. This person's to blame. These are the enemy. These are the baddies. We're all goodies. Um... By the way, 10 years later, they, they, they turn around and say, by the way, you can you can join the army now and we'll pay you. Finally, for the first time in 10 years, you've got an opportunity to get a good job as a little army man and a soldier in the army to go and fight for your nation, to be a patriot, you know. Then people are obviously going to be a little more warm to the idea and say, oh yeah, maybe that isn't such a bad idea after all. And then they're sent off to die. Um, so that that's what happened then. And people need to realise that if you're hoping that the government will look after you, you need to look back at history to see what the government did in times of difficulty in the past. Because consistently, the government have let people down. Um, the larger the government, in my view, the worse it is for society. Um, if we lived in a, in, a, in a socialistic political landscape, that would be the most prime landscape for cronyism and for people to take advantage of the system and to skim off the top and for quality of life to go through the floor. The only other thing that comes close to comparing with that in terms of a bad system is the current system that we have which is a hybrid between socialism and capitalism whereby we have government consistently bailing out massive businesses and that's what they're talking about there. That's what we're talking about now. It's this concept of mercantilism. It is the elite, the 1% of the 1% who write the rule book in every sense and have done consistently throughout society throughout the last 100 plus years. You have to ask yourself, why, do you, why were you not taught, not taught economics or economic history in school? Why is it that you don't know those things that I just read out about... Um, the actions of FDR, the supposed one of the best presidents in American history. No, one of the sickest men in American history who did, like that's only specifically looking at what they did in terms of gold, but it goes into so many different things. It goes into the smooth holly tariffs. So after the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles in, at the end of the First World War, Germany had to pay war uh, reparations to the Allied nations who won World War I as, as way of payback for World War I. And, you know, things were awful in Germany throughout the 1920s, like awful. They went through this crazy hyperinflation. People were literally starving to death. 
they were carrying around buckets, barrel loads of, of uh, what was it, Deutsche Mark, the Marks in, in Germany, the currency there. And, and it was worthless, it was completely worthless and people were starving to death. All this time, the German economy were, were Germany were, were having to try and pay war reparations to the Allied nations. Now, the whole reason they got into this hyperinflationary bubble was because they devalued their currency so much in an effort to pay back these reparations. But as a result of the smoot holly tariffs that rose, or that um, President Hoover initially brought in in something like 1930, somewhere between 1930 and 1932, I think it was 1932, these tariffs meant that basically there was a massive barrier for trade from any other country having trade with America. And that was like the death knell for Germany. After that, Germany could not pay any more reparations. They just physically couldn't. Their, 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 their trade was so limited on the international stage that they were no longer able to even muster a challenge to try and pay off their reparations. And this ended up leading to this really nationalistic, you know, feeling in Germany that ultimately ultimately allowed a maniac like Adolf Hitler to get into power and then this ultimately led to World War II. So, you know, it's always easy to look back at history whenever you think of your school books that say that, oh, Hitler was a bad man and the Germans, they, they, they made a lot of bad mistakes back in the day. But you have to go further back and go further back and go further back and there's such a cause and effect relationship at every stage of history and FDR and his actions throughout the 30s were sick to say the least and this will in all likelihood repeat itself if you've seen what 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 have we seen the last few weeks we have seen bizarrely we have seen fine stocks i.e like Facebook Amazon what is it, Alphabet, who own Google or something like that, Netflix, Google, those stocks have actually gone to all-time highs after the collapse of the, you know, because of the sickness thing that's going on at the moment. And um, you have to ask yourself why and how. It's because mercantilism, they pull the levers. They're the special interests who dominate decision-making at every level. It doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats. It doesn't matter whether it's Labour or Conservatives. The world that we're living in at the moment, this special interest group are effectively the puppeteers pulling the strings of everything, manipulating every financial market, manipulating what you can learn in school, what you can't learn, manipulating what you can talk about in mainstream media. Different things, obviously different topics you're aware of, I'm sure, that cannot be discussed on mainstream media without being shut down. And now we have YouTube and different social media platforms which are expressly forbidding us discussing different things. Or we will have restrictions placed on our videos or potentially we will have our entire accounts shut down. So these are the sorts, the sorts of things that I want people to start thinking about. What did the government do for us in history? Or how much worse the governments make things for us in history. And what do you think they're going to do down the line if we give them the opportunity to? Um, that'll do for today. The, the, main, the main sort of takeaway here for me is, especially in times of uncertainty, at times of, of high leverage over many, many cycles of bull markets, coming to like this super cycle bull market end that we're approaching, it's, it's a really sad time to be living in countries that have such big governments because we would have a chance if we had small government and really low lo levels of taxation because you could effectively try and save yourself in different ways. But for a lot of people, it's going to be impossible. So that's why it's important with what you have, with what little you likely do have in this fixed rigged world that you start being really astute in this last year or two of the ninth inning with what you do with your money because ultimately all our currencies, the fiat currency systems that we're working under at the moment are all going to collapse. Gold, silver are going to be the things that we need to move to. Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, possibly another store of value will likely you know, operate in a similar manner. But what you need to do is make the most of the bull market that we're in at the moment and we're going to be in for the next year or two in stocks and even housing but really you need to be looking at getting rid of all the debt that you have all the liabilities and exposure that you have 
and starting to move towards gold and silver and starting to get yourself more financially literate, more economically savvy, because these are incredibly important times. Um, and ultimately, how you act in this next year or two is going to have serious ramifications in the rest of your life. So, yep, that'll cover it for today. Thanks very much for watching if you've watched this far. And yeah, please do subscribe and share if you, um, you think anyone might benefit from it. Cheers, have a good one.